All right, we're um, <clears throat> we're going to give it another two minutes just to allow people to join. It does seem like we have kind of a low um, turnout um, as of right now, which I'm kind of surprised at because we had a, a fairly high um, return rate on people saying that they were going to join, but maybe everybody's going to take a look at the recorded session instead. And that just gives um, those of you who are here in person more opportunities to ask questions. So. Okay, well, it seems like uh, we don't have anybody else rolling in. So why don't we get started? Um, I just wanted to welcome everyone to our um, advanced training series on MET Plus, um, which is a verification and diagnostic framework. Um, and I want to recognize um, those that have put a lot of effort um, into the planning of um, this series, including John Opatz, Julie Prestopna, Lisa Goodrich, George McCabe, Minowin Gildemeister, um, Hank Fisher, um, myself, and then the rest of the MET Plus team. Um, this fall, we're going to be focused in on um, not only demonstrating how to use MET Plus in, in general, but um, kind of focused in on fire weather. Um, and then uh, this um, winter, we'll be looking at um, S2S and, and S seasonal forecast system. So uh, moving on, let's see. Okay. So just uh, really kind of um, going over the, the series schedule, as I said, um, this fall, um, today is November 1st. And, and so um, in essence, we're just gonna, this, while this is an advanced um, training series, it's been our, um, our experience that um, as we start up these training series, uh, at least the first one in, in each um, uh, timeframe, um, we usually need to do at, at least some kind of overview of um, MET Plus, what it is, and um, how it can be used, and then, um, you know, address uh, a particular topic. So um, today is going to have um, kind of an overview of MET Plus, and then um, uh, we're going to have a, a guest um, presentation from Amanda Seams Anderson um, talking about her use of MET Plus um, uh, for fire weather um, fields, and then also an update from our team from John, John Opatz and Bree Nelson on um, some of the improvements that they've been working on for um, our training and, and documentation. Session five um, will then be November 15th, where we're gonna continue on with the fire weather um, uh, narrative and um, really kind of dig into how to use um, one of the tools that we have available for MET Plus, which is called Python Embedding, to be able to use unique data sets um, and the data sets that we're primarily going to be focused in on are, you know, for fire weather. But once again, you know, if you can put on your creative hat, you can see how um, if you can use um, Python embedding for, um, you know, that these fire weather data sets, you can also use them for um, other data sets as well. And then we're going to take a break over the, um, over the winter, um, you know, over the holidays and so forth, and then come back in January um, and uh, dive more into um, sub-seasonal to seasonal, as well as um, seasonal forecast system. And right now, um, we're tentatively um, set for January 10th um, to do a kickoff of, of um, MET Plus, especially with a focus on S2S and, and seasonal forecast system. However, um, that may we may have a little play in that, um, that timing because our team right now is working on trying to get a, the seasonal forecast system, evaluation system um, established using... Um, the capability that has already been developed by EMC in concert with um, the Climate Prediction Center. And um, we may be a little bit behind, so we may have to um, delay, um, you know, making that presentation by a week or two. But as of right now, we're looking at January 10th um, for a, a kickoff to a three um, series um, session where we're looking at subseasonal, the seasonal and seasonal forecast system and and um, the use of MET Plus to um, compute those indices and, and so forth, as well as um, uh, as our, the last um, one in our in our training series is looking at um, upcoming capabilities, um, such as um, we are currently working on adding in um, support for unstructured grids, um, as well as uh, both for atmospheric as well as for um, 
uh, uh, like tripolar for um, oceans and, and so forth. And then um, we've been doing work with um, uh, some of the um, uh, some of our collaborators on aerosols as well as um, support for land um, uh, land surface modeling evaluation and so forth. So um, sessions six, seven, and eight are going to be focused in more on that S2S and then the um, the ability to to do some evaluation of, of um, coupled um, modeling components and, and so forth. Any questions on our series schedule um, for right now? And just confirming, can everybody hear me okay? Yes, I hear you good. Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, just a refresher on our protocol for um, this and, and all of our other training sessions. Um, this training session is being recorded, so if you are not comfortable with having your face um, you know, on the recording or your voice um, on the recording, just please be aware that we are recording it and it is being posted to the MetPlus website um, for training purposes. Um, you know, if you have a question and you don't want to necessarily have your voice on, you can always use um, chat to ask your question. Um, we do ask that you, you know, mute and turn off videos unless you're presenting or asking questions and, and so forth. You know, all of that is is fairly um, well known um, in, in our age of, of doing a lot of things virtually um, now. Um, I, I do actually want to um, encourage you to, to please ask questions um, because uh, we, we actually have, um, it looks like a fair amount of our, of our MetPlus team here. And so um, while I'm going to be going through some of the basics of MetPlus um, and, and getting you to, to think about how you might be able to use MetPlus for um, some fire weather fields, um, you know, feel free to, to go ahead and, and ask um, questions that um, maybe, you know, um, relevant to that or, you know, slightly, uh, uh, you know, one step askew from that or something like that if, if you have a question. Um, might as well take advantage of our experts um, that are here. So if you do have a question, go ahead and either put it in the chat or go ahead and raise your hand. Um, and, you know, of course, be courteous and respectful with your questions. Um, if you haven't spent a lot of time on Google Meet, although I'm sure most of you have, um, just really quickly, um, you know, over here on the left-hand side, you can see where the um, camera mute on and off are. Um, <clears throat> if you want to turn on closed captioning, you can do that by, you know, um, hitting the little CC box. If you um, are trying to demonstrate something and show us, um, you know, something to, to help with um, asking your question, um, go ahead and, and um, you know, let us know that you're going to share your screen, which is the, you know, the box with the little arrow up um, to raise and lower your hand is, you know, the, the hand um, icon. Um, and all of that's kind of on the left-hand side. And then if you want to see, you know, who else is, is participating in the um, training as well as, um, you know, uh, putting something in the chat dialog, that's over on the right-hand side. So, okay. So with that, any, um, any um, quick questions about the format of um, this particular training session or um, how to ask questions or anything like that? Okay, um, so actually, one part of um, the format of this that I did not um, I did not address is that in the past, we, um, when we've done um, these virtual training sessions, we have also tried to include a component where um, people can get on um, their computers and and try and and actually um, you know do the the work themselves and and ask questions. We found that the return on investment on trying to prepare for that kind of um, training session has not been um, all that great. Um, we there, there winds up being a lot of nuances on particular systems and, and so forth. And so um, because this is a very short training session, only um, five um, sessions itself, we've chosen not to um, have the hands-on component. Um, however, uh, that doesn't preclude you from, um, you know, going and, and trying to work through some of these examples um, you know, on your own and then um, uh, writing to us for help. And, and I'll point out in a little bit how you can go ahead and, and get help. So um, today for our, our first training um, in this um, fall advanced training series, um, we're gonna be primarily looking at um, evaluation approaches for fields related to fire weather. Um, but, you know, once again, fire weather is, is a fairly broad topic that is complex and requires a lot of different fields to be um, considered. So um, it does actually open up the opportunity for us to, to think, you know, kind of 
um, outside the box of, of even just fire itself. Um, the, this um, particular training is actually supported in, um, by two different um, lines of funding. One is the um, bilateral infrastructure law or the bill funding, um, and uh, as well as um, there's a JTTI project that Amanda Seems Anderson um, has um, that is um, working towards trying to bring some of this fire weather verification into um, um, operations. And, and so we're taking advantage of that particular project to, um, to you know, convey um, to, to this group um, you know, what we're working on and so forth. So just wanted to, to point out that um, that we are funded by two different NOAA projects um, to provide this training. So, okay, so for those of you who have already, um, you know, taken a basic training series, you've already probably heard this, what is MET Plus? Um, this is kind of a, a, um, an overview for those that have not um, necessarily taken the, the training series. Um, but basically, MET Plus is a, is a suite of um, Python wrappers that are around um, a core set of statistical tools, which are called MET model evaluation tools. Um, and then we also have analysis tools, and that um, takes uh, several different formats because it has been evolving over the past um, 15 years or so. Um, we do have a lot of connections to Python-based um, capability, um, both for computing diagnostics and doing plotting, but also um, uh, the Python embedding um, that we will be talking more about um, uh, in two weeks uh, during that training session. Um, right now we have about, a, we have over 150 traditional statistics and diagnostic methods. And um, there's about 15 interpolation methods that are available um, to allow for different, um, you know, uh, interpolation between points and, um, and different grid um, points and, and so forth. And um, MET Plus has actually been applied to temporal um, and spatial scales ranging from, you know, sub-hourly all the way out to seasonal to um, multi-decadal climate simulations. Um, so there, there is a, a wide um, impact. We, we do find that um, there are times where, uh, where the use of, um, of terminology can sometimes get in the way of understanding how MET Plus can be applied. And so that is um, part of what um, our training moving forward um, needs to be focused in on is, is trying to help people understand that there is capability um, many times already in MET Plus, And it's just a matter of understanding um, how to call it in MET Plus and, and you know, relate that to your particular application. So um, one of the strengths of MET Plus and, and one of the reasons why it is being adopted by um, many of the operational centers, um, at least within the US and, and um, uh, as part of the, the um, Unified Model Partnership is that there are um, configuration files that are, are used that can be easily shared to produce re reproducible results. And, and so that is um, one of the strengths of MET Plus and, and why um, people consider using it, um, you know, for uh, not only their, their basic verification capability, but also operational. So um, on this uh, slide also, um, many of you have already seen this, but it's just, you know, a, a word cloud of some of the examples of, of the types of um, evaluations that we have put together examples or use cases of everything from short range weather to medium range weather to tropical cyclones and precipitation and marine cryosphere and 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 so forth. Um, we have a lot of advanced diagnostic capability um, that is available, and um, you know we also um, ha have the understanding that, especially for the S2S and, and seasonal forecast system arena, there is more that um, we need to be um, working with the community on on trying to figure out how to to bring that together. Um, but there is already a fair amount of diagnostic capability in, within MET Plus. MET Plus also has things available for synthesis, such as um, scorecards, which is, you know, um, this shown here in, in um, purple and, and green. Um, things like performance diagrams, with help, which help you synthesize four different um, categorical statistics. And then, you know, being able to look at um, spatial representation of errors. So just really um, quickly, just kind of a broad brush look at, at MET Plus and um, how it, it all fits together. Um, basically, originally there was a suite of tools that were developed, model evaluation tools, and that they were developed actually 15 years ago. And it has been evolving ever since then. And um, 
several years ago, um, we decided that it was important to provide wrappers around the, the MET tools to provide kind of a, a low level um, workflow um, to allow people to understand how to pass the data from tools, one tool to another, and once again, to make it easier for reproducible results. And so MET Plus is, is um, what developed, and, and that's basically the wrappers that are, are um, written in Python and um, are basically represented as like these black arrows here to move data, not only um, from tool to tool, but also from component to MET Plus to component. Um, Within the core MET tools themselves, um, this is uh, the wire diagram. It, um, it's fairly well known um, across uh, for those that, that use MET uh, routinely. Um, there are diff different color coding um, where the, the dark green is reformatting tools. Um, the, the lighter green is um, data inspection tools or plotting tools. The blue is um, uh, statistical tools and then the yellow our analysis tools, and, and those are part of the core MET um, components, but then we have analysis tools that are beyond just what's in the, in the MET package itself. Um, we have um, the ability to, to compute traditional um, statistics, both on grid to grid and grid to point um, uh, scenarios, as well as ensemble statistics. There's a, um, several spatial methods, and then we have a, a wide variety of TC methods, tropical cyclone methods that are developing as well. So um, as far as pre-processing goes, um, I already mentioned that the, the dark green is pretty much pre-processing. Um, and the scenario that we, we've um, followed for many years was to um, try and provide support for routinely available um, uh, data sets that are used by the community um, uh, you know, in a broad sense um, and, and make sure that we have tools that can read those data and then um, reformat them so that they can be passed into the, the statistical tools and so forth. Um, we found that it, it's really hard to keep up with that. Um, data wrangling is, you know, probably about 90% of the job of um, any verification um, activity. And so um, what we did was we um, added in the capability to do Python embedding. Once again, we're going to have um, more of a focus on that um, in the next um, se uh, session on the, the 15th. Um, but uh, just know that Python embedding is is um, is there to kind of help um, support and enhance our ability to to read in on lots of different data sets. Um, tools that compute um, standard statistics are pretty much kind of down here at the the base of of the the core stack of of um, statistical tools. It's grid stat, which does grid to grid verification, point stat, which does point to grid verification and ensemble stat. Um, and then we also have, um, you know, our tools that compute um, basic um, statistics for tropical cyclones. Um, we also have, as I mentioned, analysis tools that are part of the core MET components. Um, and then we also have extensions beyond that um, called MET Viewer and MET Express. Um, we also have uh, a lot of diagnostics, as I already mentioned. Um, and, you know, those are um, spatial methods, like the method for object-based diagnostic evaluation, um, mode time domain, um, and uh, series analysis, which computes um, statistics at every grid point, so you can get a, a um, geographical representation of the errors. Um, grid diag tool, um, you know, looks at the, the bimodal or the, um, the joint distribution between um, two different um, fields and, and gives you a sense of, of how those are related and, and so forth. And then once again, um, uh, we have been adding in more um, tropical cyclone diagnostic tools as well. Um, additionally, for computing diagnostics, um, we have um, in the world of Python, um, MetCalcPy and MetPlotPy, which do pretty much exactly what they are named. So MetCalcPy um, is responsible for doing a lot of the calculations that are associated with the, the Python um, analysis suite that we are in the process of developing. And MetPlotPy does a lot of the plotting um, for that um, Python-based analysis suite as well. Um, so uh, that analysis suite um, is, uh, as I said, basically kind of like one big conglomerate of tools that are available. Um, it started out with uh, uh, two database-driven applications, MetViewer and MetExpress. Um, and then uh, it expanded to include Utilities um, that are uh, 
that um, uh, allow for reading in particular data sets that are, are um, you know, uh, pertinent to um, either being um, imported into the database or being used um, for diagnostics in the, in the Python um, suite of tools. And then MetCalcPy, MetPlotPy, um, you know, as I said, do the calculation and, and the, um, the plotting. So basically, um, we have now this um, the suite of tools called MetPlus Analysis Tools. And right now, there's work in progress to allow for command line use of analysis of, of the analysis tools. And, and so that will be um, allowing us to kind of remove the dependency on, on the database if, if you choose not to have a database. Um, and, and for folks that are in a, more of an operational setting, um, could allow them to, to have the same kind of um, aggregation and plotting as um, if you were to, to have a database application, as long as it's a small data set, um, and then you know be able to, to have that plotting the same. Looks like there was a question that came in um, from Eric. Um, how does a statistical tool differ from an analysis tool? Um, good question. Uh, so the statistical tools, um, is, uh, I guess how I, how I um, uh, kind of put this in my mind um, is that uh, these particular tools met, um, so grid stat, point stat, and so forth, um, you know, the statistics are being computed over like the entire um, the entire domain or the entire grid or the entire region of interest um, at a given point in time. Um, and then we use the analysis um, tools to actually um, aggregate over time, um, whether it's over lead times or over um, initialization times or, or um, something like that. And so um, the analysis tools allows you to... to um, you know, compute the statistics um, over the particular re time of interest that you're in, um, that you would like to to do your analysis. Um, does anybody else on the MetPlus team want to um, to jump in there and, and clarify that a little bit more? And Eric says, yeah. So both our statistics, they are yes. It's just how how the data are um, basically aggregated together. MetPlus team, are you um, satisfied with my um, my response to that? Oh, yes, John. No, sorry, I was meaning to give you a thumbs up. Yeah, it sounds good. Thanks, Tara. Okay, it gave me a chance to take a take a drink anyway, so that's perfect. Thank you for that break. <laughs> um. Okay, so um, once again, just trying to, to cover the breadth of what's in MetPlus in a very short period of time. Um, this is actually, uh, this table here is, is actually a couple years old and we need to update it. Um, but these are uh, at least a, a general sense of the reproducible statistics um, and methods that um, we have available in MetPlus beyond all the other um, things that I've already touched on. So, um, <clears throat> We do have the computation of contingency tables, statistics, and continuous statistics, um, statistics for probabilistic forecasts, um, the application of confidence intervals um, for ensemble statistics, you know, things like spread skill, rank histograms, um, ignorance score, um, um, rank, uh, 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 yeah, actually several different histograms, in, including integral transform and, and so forth. Um, we have um, all the spatial methods that I had already kind of talked about um, with the, the, um, the object-based methods. However, we also have like distance maps, um, distance measures. We have neighborhood methods, which are kind of over here on the right-hand side. We have um, methods that do um, decomposition of, excuse me, do domain decomposition and, and decomposition of errors. Um, this is certainly an area um, that we can um, expand upon, but, but we do have some of the basic um, core capability. And then I'd already mentioned um, a, a whole host of, of um, uh, capability that we're adding for um, tropical cyclones, um, including looking at things from different um, uh, projections, like from the radius of maximum wind, and um, and some of the additional diagnostic um, methods that are um, currently in use at the National Hurricane Center. Um, and then over here on the, the left-hand side um, is just kind of showing um, some examples of, of like unique uh, masking that you could use 
to identify different areas of, of interest. Um, what's floating across the top is, is day night masking. Um, so if you have a, a particular field that is um, you know, only really um, visible during the day or the night or, or their response is different based on um, you know, what time of day it is, you may want to use a, a masking um, a scenario that, that allows you to, to um, distinguish the, um, the skill um, based on that masking. In the middle um, is an, an, an example of having multiple um, storm following um, masks um, and, and looking at the field, um, you know, uh, within, say, like 50 um, kilometers and 100 kilometers and, and 150 kilometers and so forth of, say, like a tropical storm or something like that. And then down here at the bottom is, um, you know, using different um, latitude bands um, to, uh, to uh, mask out um, your your field um, and so forth. And then one other thing that was added many years ago that has been you know, a strength of MetPlus and, and has provided a lot of um, uh, savings as far as um, computation is the ability to define um, on what grid you, you do your regrid, or excuse me, you do your verification. So you can do that regridding actually um, either using tools that um, are available um, through MetPlus or um, by automatically just um, setting the, the um, regridding tool, excuse me, the regridding grid um, within the configuration file for MetPlus. Um, more examples, um, here's uh, examples of spatial representation of errors, both for, for like point data, looking at point observations and, and um, the errors kind of aggregated over a particular set of time um, and or for um, gridded fields. Um, we have recently added in um, some more diagnostics to help uh, model developers to look at things like tendencies within the, the models themselves. Um, just a couple of examples of ensemble measures, you know, um, the reliability diagrams and rank histograms. And then I'd already talked about some of the synthesis tools. So I already talked about um, performance diagrams. Here's an example from the grid diag tool looking at um, the joint distribution between two different fields. And um, this is actually an ensemble measure that was um, uh, contributed by um, the Naval Research Lab, um, kind of looking at the difficulty of, of prediction, um, ensemble prediction for different fields and so forth. A additional examples, um, looking at, um, you know, different ways of, of um, quantifying tropical cyclone um, uh, responses to subseasonal to seasonal forcing, whether it's genesis or just um, you know the the um, <clears throat> existence of tropical cyclones. Um, lots of different S2S diagnostics, including um, being able to take means over particular, um, say for instance, seasons. Like this is December, January, February um, mean temperature um, at 500 millibars. Um, you know, just being able to to take those those means um, looking at things like space-time coherence, um, Hoffmuller diagrams, um, and then systematic errors. Um, we have uh, some methods that allow you to, to look at um, systematic errors, whether it's at, at a, on a synoptic scale or on a, a shorter time scale, um, and uh, try and identify um, why your uh, model may not be predicting a particular feature um, as uh, skillfully as, as you anticipate. So lots of different examples. Um, just really quickly, I, I don't want to like completely open it up, but I do want to take a moment to see if there's any questions anybody wants to ask about just basic capability before we dive into um, you know how to how to get started. Okay. Okay. So um, once again, uh, this while this is an advanced training series, um, we have chosen not to um, to take the time to um, work on, you know, helping everybody get set up um, in their environments and, and running um, the scripts and, and so forth. We do have several examples of, of how to to get started with that. Um, there is the basic training series which we ran um, in 2021 through 2022. There were 20 different sessions. Um, it covered many of our, of our tools, including just the basics of getting set up and so forth. 
So here's the website for that. Just wanted to point out that um, that is actually a really great place to start um, to, to kind of just work through, um, you know, the basics of MedPlus. It, it also um, leverages our online training um, uh, that we have available as well. We also did have, um, uh, uh, once again, a, a short advanced training series um, this spring that was um, primarily focused on um, subseasonal to seasonal. And, um, and uh, we supported, you know, um, platforms, um, NOAA platforms, um, Cheyenne for uh, NCAR, um, and as well as, you know, people's individual Linux platforms. We also um, did have a, a, a setup on um, Amazon Web Service. Um, and um, once again, we have that, um, that AMI available. We just have chosen not to um, take the time to get that set up. So if, if you do want to be doing any um, testing on AWS um, during this session, um, go ahead and reach out to, um, to us um, and let us know. And um, you know we'll, we'll try and see if we can get you hooked up on AWS to do some testing. Any questions about basics of, of um, you know, where you may want to look for, for getting started on um, just general MetPlus training? Okay. Um, and then I wanted to point out that we do have our online training. Once again, um, it is integrated into um, the, the training videos that we have from the basic um, 20 series um, training uh, session that we have. Um, here's the link to that. Um, we update it for every major release. So um, this is, we're on um, MetPlus version 5.1. So the, the current online training that we have is available for 5.0 and 5.1. It is relevant for both. Um, you'll notice that the, the contents, um, you know, does have, um, we're, we're working on adding in a kind of like a, a basic verification review um, to help those that don't really know as much about verification kind of get started with that. Um, John Opaz is going to talk about that. Um, we do have, um, you know, the basics of getting that plus set up. And then how to um, do grid to grid and grid to ops verification um, to run series analysis and stat analysis, some of our, our, our analysis tools to, um, you know, work with ensembles and, and probabilistic forecasts to, um, you know, work with our, uh, our object-based methods, mode and mode time domain. Um, a few examples on how to use tropical cyclone track and intensity um, verification. Um, how to do the, the slightly more advanced um, feature relative examples looking for systematic errors, um, how to use our, our Python-based um, analysis tools that I was talking about that we're in the process of um, developing not only support for um, the, the database and display systems, but also command line. Um, uh, examples of, of how to use Python embedding, um, some examples for subseasonal to seasonal, and then also, once again, how to um, kind of work within the cloud um, for MedPlus. So there's a whole host of online training um, also available at this um, location right here that I would recommend that you um, consider, um, you know, uh, attempting. And if you um, need help, then we recommend that you um, come to our discussions page, which is on GitHub, MedPlus Discussions. Um, we have a, a actually most of our team here, um, you know, works to to um, manage the the discussions. We hope that the um, that the community um, will re respond and answer questions. But much of the time, it's it's our team that's um, answering those questions. But if you're running into um, you know a problem with getting going with um, some of the training or 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 something like that, feel free to go ahead and, and post to MedPlus discussions. Um, as well as peruse what has already been, um, you know, asked. Um, maybe that someone has already asked the question that, that you um, have um, with regards to how to use MetPlus and so forth. Um, I also wanted to point out that we do have um, a lot of different users guides. We have users guides that are focused on MetPlus, the Python wrappers, um, on Met, the core statistical tools, and then each component of um, the MetPlus analysis suite. And so there's, there is a lot of documentation. And um, once again, John Opatz later today 
we'll be talking about how we're trying to pull that together to make it easier for people to find, um, you know, the, the answers to the questions that they're they're looking for. Um, but I just wanted to, to point out that um, we do have a lot of um, user's guide documentation. Um, once again, questions. Okay, so um, just really quickly thinking about this. Um, if you are starting a verification project, um, you know, what, what, what kind of questions do you need to think about? What do you need to um, take into account? I mean, first, first of all, um, at least I would be thinking about the data types that I have. You know, what kind of forecasts am I, am I trying to evaluate? Um, and am I trying to use um, point observations or am I using some kind of analysis field um, as far as, as my, um, you know, benchmark or state or truth or, or you know, whatever I'm, I'm comparing against? So um, in knowing what kind of data types you're, you're working with, that will help you to, to determine which um, uh, tools that you need to be using for MetPlus. Um, and I already kind of pointed to this, but knowing whether they're gridded fields or point observations is, is fairly critical. Um, the other thing that you may want to be thinking about is um, what are some user relevant thresholds? Once again, um, like in the world of fire weather, um, I'm, I, there are definitely um, particular thresholds that um, <clears throat> the forecasters or, or the, the, the folks that are in the field, you know, are, are keying in on um, to help them make decisions. And so you can build that into your verification. And so knowing what those, um, those thresholds are is, is pretty critical in, um, in setting up your verification capability. And then just also understanding what relationships you want to explore. So um, I don't want to spend a lot of time going through lots of examples. Um, Amanda's going to show some of them. We're going to see more examples on the 15th. I just wanted to like kind of throw out there um, some ideas for people to think about. And, um, and I, I did take um, at least the, the images from the NOAA Fire Weather Testbed website um, that is new and is just getting going, um, you know, just trying to tie back to um, one of the one of our sponsors and, and make this, you know, relevant to um, to uh, the work that's going on um, at that the fire weather test bed. But you know, clearly, um, having an understanding of how well the surface winds and moisture um, are being predicted, you know, that's very important. Understanding precipitation is important. Understanding synoptics. Um, you know, having a sense of what's going on with lightning might help um, with understanding um, uh, ignition uh, prediction and, and so forth. Um, knowing about fuel content, soil moisture, um, fire spread, um, you know, aerosols, like this is the surface PM 2.5 and, and the impact of, of fire on, um, you know, other related fields and variables. What other um, fields um, do we need to be keeping in mind with, um, when we're talking about fire weather? And I'm going to be quiet for a second, and hopefully some people will will jump in and, and provide some some other ideas. So Amanda, I'm going to put you on the spot. Did I did I cover all the basics, or are there some other ones that we need to be thinking about? So I was quiet because I do think you covered most of what I've dealt with in the past working on fire projects. Um, the only thing I might add is I found it's really important, depending on what you're working on, to listen to what your stakeholders are looking for. Mm -hmm. um, so a project I'll talk about uh, when I give my presentation, the Colorado Fire Prediction System, our stakeholders was State of Colorado Center of Excellence for Aerial Firefighting. And we were really concerned that our model was over predicting the spread of the fire. Um, it could be two or three times larger than the fire itself was. But our stakeholders weren't concerned about that. They wanted to know the direction and speed of the spread more than the extent of the spread. Uh, so I found it's really important to know what your end user is looking for. Um, it might be something different than us on the weather side would be considering. Interesting. Interesting. Thank you. That, that, that's really good. Um, anybody else want to chime in there?
Okay. Well, in the interest of time, then I'm going to continue on because we, we actually do want to hear what Amanda has to talk about. So I, I guess um, the, the point I wanted to make here is, you know, is um, once again, kind of think about the fields that you want to, to be looking at because that will help you um, also kind of decide how to get started with MET Plus because we have a lot of different examples of, of how to get started. And those examples are called use cases. And I already pointed um, in one of the previous slides to the documentation um, that has these use cases. It's, it's MET Plus documentation. Um, and, and basically what a use case is, is it um, you know, provides sample data, it has a sample configuration, it um, has some basic documentation and it shows you how to run um, a particular um, MET Plus example. Um, and we have this broken down into um, two different types of use cases. There's those that are demonstrating just the basic um, capability of MET tools. Um, and then we have them um, broken down um, based on different applications. Um, and I'm actually going to go backwards. You'll notice here um, that we have an application. We have a, a section that's specifically kind of focused in on subseasonal to seasonal. Um, you know, it, you can click on it, and then it, it, there are um, lots of different examples um, or use cases for subseasonal to seasonal. So let's um, let's talk about just even um, basic uh, precipitation or, or surface winds or something like that. Um, say, for instance, you want to look at surface winds. We we already do have an example that shows how to do. Um, uh, evaluation using um, grid stat, which would be using um, gridded forecasts and like a gridded analysis field um, to look at um, things like wind speed and, and um, temperature and relative humidity. Um, we also have examples showing um, how to use point stat to, to do basically the same thing, to, to do evaluation of, um, say, once again, wind, wind speed direction. Um, and uh, relative humidity, temperature, and so forth. Um, and we have those specifically laid out for um, the MET tools. We also have examples of, you know, um, many examples of how to do evaluation of precipitation or, um, uh, you know, marine cryosphere or uh, short range weather or medium range weather and, and so forth. So um, here's an example of a use case. And this is just a, a if, if we were to go to um, to use cases by Met tool and we just go to point stat and um, pull down the the most basic use case, um, this is what you would see. You'd um, open it up. You'd see point stat basic use case. It talk a little bit about a scientific objective and the data sets and you know what components of Met Plus are, are being called and how things are being called. Um, it would then uh, go through. A much longer example of, of the MetPlus configuration than what I have here. I just have a couple of screenshots, but here, you know, it shows you how to set um, how the like the process list is being set up, and you can see that there is documentation on, on how to um, set things up. Um, you know, how to to set up your um, your beginning times, your end times, your files. Um, we have you know documentation on how to to set up the templates for your file naming convention and and so forth. You continue further down um, because Met Plus is a, a Python wrapper around a core tool um, for Met or a core set of tools. There is also um, just the Met configuration um, information in there, just in, in case you want to see how um, the the Python wrappers interact with the, the Met configuration. And then if you continue on further, um, it shows you how to run Met Plus. You know how to call it. Um, and then, you know, what the, the expected output might be and so forth. So I just really wanted to, to point out to you that um, we do have a lot of these examples. And so, um, you know, as we're talking today and, and you know, further on throughout the advanced training series, um, you know, if you want to try and get started with some of this, once again, um, going to some of the, the um, basic use cases for the tools may be a really good place for you to start. Okay, so um, I'm actually basically to um, any other questions. Um, we're pretty much right on time. Um, Want to uh, basically see if there's any questions. We'll take a quick break, and then we'll come back, and Amanda can you know talk about her use of Met Plus for fire weather fields, and, and really kind of give you more of a 
of a, um, a true feeling of, of, you know, what she's run into with with regards to verification of fire weather fields. And then John, as I said, um, is gonna be talking about upcoming improvements. So any questions um, in like the next couple of minutes? Once again, we have like our whole team here. So it's a great opportunity to ask a question. And there are no stupid questions. Okay, well then if we don't have any more questions, um, it is 10 minutes to the top of the hour. So why don't we go ahead and, and take our ten, take a 10 minute break. We'll start back up at um, 10 a.m. Mountain Time, noon Central, or it's, yeah, noon, um, excuse me, Eastern Time. And, uh, and uh, Amanda will be diving into her description at that point. See you in 10. So Amanda, are you ready? Yeah. Okay. So um, I, I just wanted to welcome Amanda. It's our pleasure to have a, have her here um, helping us understand how MEPLUS has already been used um, for um, evaluation as well as, you know, some of the, the challenges that she's run into um, for fire weather fields. Um, I do want to once again encourage folks to, to go ahead and, and bring up questions and ideas and thoughts. Um, we have um, plenty of time um, today to um, to have a discussion about, um, you know, what Amanda's talking about and, and maybe things that you've run into that you're thinking about as far as um, doing evaluation. And fire weather is definitely something that's going to be on the, the horizon for a long time, for, you know, at least the next five to ten years. So let's... Um, Let's feel free to, to uh, have a conversation about um, what else we need to be keeping in mind um, so that we can uh, make sure that uh, MetPlus is, is useful moving forward. So with that, um, Amanda, take it away. Great. Thank you, Tara. Uh, yes, please feel free to jump in at any point in time, um, either through the chat or through raising your hand um, on the Google Meet window. But I just put together a short presentation to give a few examples about how I've used MetPlus or uh, did verification that can be or will be included in MetPlus uh, through the project that Tara mentioned a little bit earlier. This is all based on a project called the Colorado Fire Prediction System that I was involved in from about, I think, 2017 through 2019, 2020. So first I wanted to go over a little bit of background of that project so you understand um, the kind of forecast we did and the kind of verification we were looking at. So this was in collaboration with the State of Colorado Center of Excellence for Aerial Firefighting, which was developed as part of a Colorado legislature bill alongside this project to put together this fire prediction system that can be used alongside their operations for managing wildland fire across the state. And the core technology it was built on in the middle here was the coffee model, which is coupled atmosphere, wildland fire environment model, as well as the different products that were output from that. We actually ended up really using uh, a iteration of coffee that's called WERF Fire that's available as part of the WERF model suite to the community, where we produced 18-hour predictions of coupled weather and fire behavior on a 100-meter scale. Products that came out of this, in addition to weather observations like wind, temperature, and humidity, were also fire specific, such as the spread of the fire, the rate and extent of that, sensible heat release, moisture flux, smoke concentration. The input data to this model was large-scale weather environment, 
uh, specifically for most of the examples, the her was used as the boundary conditions to start off the model. We also need to know where the fire location was so that we could build a 13 by 13 kilometer inner domain around that fire. This came from a variety of sources, could be satellite or uh, the state of Colorado uses the multi-mission aircraft or MMA, which I'll talk about in a little bit. We also needed to know information about the fuels, what the type of the fuels were, what the fuel moisture content was of them. And then we had terrain elevation information in there as well. Once the model ran, uh, the output products were given to a display system called CoWIMS, which is a type of display used by the state of Colorado. A number of other states use it as well. And this is how it got to the tactical fire management teams and was also helpful for future fire weather. Um, for example, incident meteorologists from the National Weather Service uh, were interested in this product. Uh, another stakeholder that we engaged with a lot was the air quality folks at the state level. So I mentioned where fire is a coupled model, and this was a really important distinction for where fire versus other fire spread models. So in most fire spread models, the atmospheric conditions, such as the wind, relative humidity, temperature, affects the rate of spread and direction, as well as the fuel moisture content. So the weather forces the fire model, and then you have some output of how the fire might behave. In WERF fire, because it's coupled, the burning of the fuel will release heat and water vapor into the atmosphere, which can cause different changes to the atmospheric parameters as well. So there's a back and forth there. And once those atmospheric parameters change, so does the fire behavior. Just an example of what this output looks like. Uh, this is from the last chance fire in 2012 in eastern Colorado. Uh, on this day, a tire burst on a car on a highway and uh, the rim of the wheel sparked. And that spark led to a fire that moved very rapidly. I think there were like 50 mile an hour southerly winds that spread it and uh, damaged last chance significantly. On the left is a map of that fire. So the green colors are the fuel types. Light green was short grass. And then we also had grass and understory in the dark green in a few areas. Because this was eastern Colorado, it was less complex than it is in the um, up in the terrain. And then there was also a number of no fuel areas, uh, such as buildings and roads. We all know buildings burn, but for the sake of the model, um, these built up areas tend to be no fuel areas. The ignition point was down here in the yellow star. And the orange shading is the actual perimeter of this fire. And the blue outline is the uh, output from the WERF fire model. A couple of things I want to point out here. Uh, the, the direction and the speed of spread was quite good from the model, just looking at it subjectively. But um, we see that it over predicted slightly. That's one of the shortcomings of WARF fire is we don't have human intervention in the model. So if there are teams out there doing fire suppression activities, we don't have a way to capture that as part of the forecast. So we do tend to over predict uh, whether it's a fault of the model or it's because we can't take that fire suppression into account. On the right is an animation of the smoke concentration from seven local time to 1900 local time on the 25th when this fire occurred. And this gives a good sense of not just the smoke output from the fire, but also what it looks like as it uh, spreads and covers some burn areas. We'll also see that now the smoke appears to be laying down. This is the evening transition where the boundary layer is decoupling. And so we, we get that effect. You can also see the wind direction is changing towards the end of the animation. So that was just a little background on the COFIPS project. Uh, now I want to talk about some example verifications we did as part of that project. We had a full um, sub, one of the tasks in the task 
um, agreement with the state of Colorado was to do verification. So we had a lot of opportunity to look at fires through different years. This specific case that I'm showing first is how we use the Met Plus tools to help verify the weather portion of the forecast. So here we had 13 different fires that occurred. Most of them were in 2016. Pine Tree and Deep Creek at the end there were in September 2017. We did this as part of some sensitivity tests we were performing with the model. So we wanted to see how the fuel moisture content varying from very low at 2% to very high at 22% would affect the fire behavior in the model. We also wanted to see, we were making some terrain improvements from the low resolution one kilometer terrain to the higher resolution 100 meter terrain. However, that last row there, that 100 meter terrain tended to crash the model. So the center row there was a 100 meter elevation, but was locally filtered uh, to enable the model to uh, do a full 18 hour forecast. We also wanted to look at two different fuel type models. One was the Anderson fuel types from 1973, and then the other was the Scott and Bergen uh, from 2005, which was an update to those fuel types. So we used MET Plus to look at how the weather portion of the forecast was affected by uh, these different model settings. We used two models uh, in MET Plus. One was the output from WERF FIRE or CoFPS, and then we also use the HER as a baseline uh, for comparison. We got our observations from the MATIS dissemination. Most of them were remote automated weather stations or RAWs, but occasionally there were other station types that were inside the model domain. And we looked at air temperature, relative humidity, and the wind speed and direction. So just what the workflow of that looked like, we had our forecast and our observations that we put into the point stat tool. And we used that to produce match pairs so we could create some time series plots. The reason we approached it this way is I mentioned it's a 13 by 13 kilometer domain. It's really small. We were lucky if we had one station in there, maybe two or three. So because we don't have a long period of time where we were looking at the forecast. It was just that one 18 hour run for when the fire was occurring. It was just that tiny area around where the fire was occurring. We didn't really have enough different observations to be able to produce aggregated statistics. But MetPlus was very useful in creating those match pairs for us um, that we could then pull from the output of the system and be able to look at time series plots. So here's an example of what one of those looks like. I apologize, it's a little messy, but this was for the Coal Springs Fire, one specific weather station that was located in that domain. Uh, the, HER out, um, the HER wind direction is in the blue line here. Observations are in the black. And then we had two different work fire outputs, one with the Anderson fuel type and one with the Scott and Bergen. Uh, we can't get a lot of information out of a plot like this in terms of how well systematically WERF is performing versus what we're getting from her. But some interesting information, for example, occurred around 2 UTC, where the WERF output for the Anderson fuel type had quite a different wind direction than for Scott and Bergen. So we did see that in addition to affecting the fire spread, it was affecting the actual weather forecast and specifically when these winds turned from more easterly to a more westerly component, which is really important for fire behavior. Another example, again, with wind direction, but this time looking at the different terrain resolutions, not as big a difference as the fuel type, but there are some differences between the various uh, work fire outputs based on terrain, showing again how the fire was affecting the forecast of the model. Another example using point stat that I wanted to share was looking at how well the HER performed relative to red flag warning criteria. This was some work done as part of the significant opportunities in atmospheric research and science or SOARS program 
uh, is a summer internship program uh, available here at NCAR. And uh, our protege this summer, Vanessa Dunham, was working with uh, the Met Plus suite of tools to look at how we might develop some use cases that we could include in future Met Plus releases relevant to our stakeholders for fire weather. And one of the items of interest is the National Weather Service Office that we're collaborating with has criteria for their red flag warning. And they're interested in how different models are performing relative to those criteria when they're considering issuing a red flag warning. So we took the HER to look at that. And then we also had NEDIS observations that we used to look at relative humidity and wind speed and direction. Uh, so we used MET Plus wrappers to run the point stat tool, in addition to looking at continuous statistics like mean error, root mean squared error. We put in the red flag criteria of relative humidity less than 15% and wind speeds greater than 25 miles per hour to see not just how well HER was performing for those variables, but specifically how well it was capturing when the relative humidity dropped that low or when the winds were that high. And then uh, she used MetViewer to create some plots. So just a couple examples of that. Here's a performance diagram for our relative humidity that was part of that output. Success ratio, or one minus the false alarm rate, is on the x-axis here. Probability detection is on the y-axis. The shaded um, curved lines are critical success index from 0 0.1 to 1 in the upper right corner. And then the dashed lines are bias with the bias of one in the middle here. Essentially, this is a quick look at contingency statistics where your ideal performance is in the upper right. She broke these down based on different initialization times of the model. And what we saw was, for the most part, as we got closer to the time of the particular fire she was looking at in 2018, the model was improving on honing in on those red flag criteria that uh, values. And then she did the same thing with wind gust, uh, where we saw that the HER actually was not performing very well with, for wind gust speed at any of the initialization times. So the forecasters might be able to trust the HER for relative humidity, but for wind gust speed, it's really not capturing those high values that they're looking for in order to issue the red flag warning. So they would need to keep that in mind as they're looking at different sources of uh, data to inform their forecast. So moving on from the weather component, which is pretty straightforward to adopt those different weather parameters into MetPlus, I wanna talk a little bit about fire spread, which also comes out of work fire. So hypothetically, we did not actually do this because we did this a number of years ago um, before the MetPlus tools were in the uh, maturity that they are now. One could use GridStat to read in the war fire spread and then an observation of the fire spread area to produce some statistics. We basically treated fire spread like one would treat precipitation uh, when you're doing those sorts of comparisons. So the observation types we had for this were shape files. The, our sources were the National Interagency Fire Center or the multi-mission aircraft or what, really whatever we could get our hands on. Just an example of what that might look like for this particular fire, the multi-mission aircraft or MMA was flown over the fire uh, to make some observations. On the left here is the view from the infrared camera on that aircraft. And on the right is a shape file uh, representation of the output of the fire perimeter based on that observation. And what they do is um, somebody that's using the camera sitting in the aircraft, and they'll physically draw the perimeter around the image to create that shape file. So we produced some contingency statistics. Uh, again, here's an example of a performance diagram that we looked at, like we looked at earlier. 
And these were for the two different field types from those 2016 and 2017 fires I mentioned earlier for the point static sample. And each different shape was a different fire from those 2016 fires. And what we see is, I, as I mentioned earlier uh, in this session, where fire tends to overpredict, whether that is related to not bringing in fire suppression information or some issues with the model. Uh, it really varies from case to case. But they tend to be in the upper left there where we have a high probability of detection, but we also have a really high false alarm rate. However, if we compare fire to fire with the Scott and Bergen fuel type, we tend to have that higher probability of detection, but we're also moving to the left for most of these fires which indicates an increase in the false alarm as well. And we did the same thing for the moisture sensitivity, where, of course, when the fuel moisture content is lower, the probability of detection is higher because the spread is higher. That bias is quite high. And then we were able to do it for the train as well and see what the differences were there. Usually, we only have maybe one perimeter for a particular forecast, so we can't really look at how it changes through time for one 18-hour forecast. But for this pine tree example, we did have three perimeters within that uh, period. So we did some comparisons. This, one, this example is specifically the different terrain types and how it varied not just between the terrain types, but also through time. So for example, on the right, we see that the bias was higher with the one kilometer terrain than with our 100 meter terrains. And it was a little higher at um, the middle perimeter around eight UTC than it was for our first or last perimeter. And then one final example I want to talk about is something we're just starting up now uh, with the NOAA project that Tara mentioned at the beginning of the session. But we're hoping to incorporate it into MET Plus and also into use cases. Our stakeholders at the state of Colorado really didn't care about that over prediction of the fire perimeter. They wanted to know where the fire was going and how fast it's going there. And that sort of question really lends itself very well to uh, the mode time domain tool which is method for object-based detection, sorry, method for object-based diagnostic evaluation, I believe. So basically what this tool would do is we would have our fire perimeter as an object and our observed perimeter as an object. And we would be able to build a three-dimensional object through time using the time domain as our Z. And then we can get a sense of how the perimeter is evolving in shape through time and how quickly. Uh, those are the statistics that would come out of the running this tool in MET Plus. But the issue we're running into is one of perimeter availability. But for this particular example, this is the 416 fire uh, from 2018. We had four perimeters available across 30 hours. So we, this, this is pretty good uh, in terms of getting fire perimeters. So what we're attempting to do, and we'll continue working on in the coming year, is we produced an interpolation so that we could have hourly boundaries, so that we could get that regular interval, finer scale that MTD is expecting. And then we can treat it sort of like a precipitation system where we have 30 outputs from our forecast model, and then we have the 30 observations to go with it. And then we can get more of a quantitative sense of where the fire is moving and how quickly. So that's one of the next tasks we're looking to do uh, as part of this project. But talking about fire data is talking about lack of data and issues with data. So I did want to mention that um, before I finish up here. When we look at weather, it's really easy to work with. Uh, it's modeled worldwide, usually on a regular grid. There's always weather occurring, so you can get 
really long periods. You know, you can do three, two, three, four years of verification on a type, different type of model or whatever you're looking at. And the weather also is generally observed regularly into international standards of what the instrumentation uh, should be in terms of upkeep of the instrumentation, as well as the precision, how often the observations are taken, and to what uh, preciseness level, um, you know, 0 0.1 degrees Celsius, for example. We also really benefit from having regular repositories for these data. If I want observations of precipitation, I know I can go online and grab the stage four product and it's really straightforward. But that none of this is the case with wildfire. We're only modeling it at the location of the fire on a really small grid. We don't really get a warning that it's going to happen. So we can't really look at the lead up to it. And usually we're looking behind in trying to estimate where the fire started. So if you want to start from an ignition point, it's usually an estimate, and you might not get that estimate from the authorities for two, three, four days. So it can be really difficult to do some of that tactical forecasting as well as verifying how that tactical model is performing. And when they do take observations, they set up weather stations around that fire, but it's for real-time data. They want the incident meteorologist wants to be able to give that information to the responders, and that's it. It's not really for going back and looking at how well your model performed. That's not taken into account. So the data are taken irregularly for a specific purpose and not really well suited to ver the verification task. There are also a ton of different repositories if the data are archived at all in different formats. I know. Our stakeholders at the state of Colorado told us that some of the information we might need to verify our model were on paper in filing cabinets west of Fort Collins, which is really difficult to get to. So it can be really hard to do this kind of verification, the same standards that we do weather verification. So just to reiterate some of these data quality issues, if you are able to find the data, there's no consistency in what those data might look like, the formats, the, um, the intervals they're taking in, and you might have a ton of observations for this fire and hardly any for another fire. We can have 24 hours or more between fire perimeters, which makes it very difficult to verify fire spread rate and direction, for example. And some of our model variables that are output from were fire like flame length just don't have any observations at all. Um, another issue I want to mention, I didn't have an example, but we did look a little bit at air quality and the smoke output from were fire. And depending on where the fire was located, it was really difficult to get any uh, mixing ratios or uh, PM 2.5s that could be used to compare. So we had the same data issue even with air quality, um, though we, we didn't have much time to look into more remote sensing options like satellite. We can also be missing critical data or the data are inaccurate. Uh, a couple examples, we had a fire where the ignition location was outside of the fire perimeter. So if you just uh, initialized your model based on that, the fires wouldn't overlap at all. And another issue we ran into was one of the databases we were using had their time of ignition labeled in UTC. But after some issues with the model performance, we cross-checked that and they were actually using local time. So it, the timestamp was local, but they labeled it as UTC. So there's just a lot of uh, quality control that one needs to do when working with data outside of the weather community and in some of these remote areas where we might not have a good network of weather stations. So just to summarize what I found doing some of this work, uh, I found that the existing MetPlus tools such as PointStat and GridStat are really well suited to fire weather and fire model verification. 
especially if you're focusing on relevant metric weather metrics, uh, it's really helpful to have those different thresholds that one can set in the MetPlus wrappers to really get at what the end users are looking for. Uh, also, I didn't show any examples, but the VX mask tool to do some masking of areas like a WFO or a area of interest that might have a high fire danger is really useful. And if you make a few modifications to ingest some of these non-traditional data like shapefiles, uh, these tools can be really powerful. Um, we'll, we'll be looking at that on November 15th about how we can use some of the Python wrappers to help read in the fire data. And then I just wanted to mention again the NOAA project that Tara brought up at the beginning of the session called Integrated Fire Weather Forecast System Verification into MetPlus. Uh, it's a two-year project. We're uh, about halfway through, not quite halfway through. And as part of this project, we will be uh, looking to add any relevant metrics that might need to be added to MetPlus and definitely use cases based on some examples here and other useful examples that will be included in future MetPlus releases that will hopefully be helpful to the community as they look to use MetPlus for fire weather and fire verification. And that's all I had. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks, Amanda. It looks like, Hank, you have a question? Yeah, this is a little more of a technical question, but I was wondering um, how much data massaging did you have to do before the, you, you know, all of your input data um, was able to be ingested, you know, using the wrappers or met, um, you know, I, I assume her and Worf net CDF output worked pretty well, but you know, how much of the observations did you need to do sort of some pre-processing on, or did it all work fairly seamlessly? So specific to the weather variables, it worked pretty seamlessly. Uh, there's a Metis to NC tool that we used, and that captured a lot of those remote stations in the areas we were interested in. Um, so that was quite straightforward. Uh, the WERF output was a little more difficult because it needed to go through the unified post processor to be in a format to get into MetPlus. So the her just went straight in there. It was super easy. But when we're starting to look at WERF and WERF fire output, that required some more effort. Uh, and I do need to give the caveat that I'm still learning how to uh, massage the data to uh, get some of those fire relevant parameters in there. Uh, those were kind of future examples. I would encourage you to attend on November 15th if you're available, because we'll address specifically getting fire perimeters into MetPlus. Um, but I do need the MetPlus's team help on that. So that'll be November 15th. Yeah, that's cool. I, you know, we're, you know, we're sort of continually developing, you know, things like that um, to, to help get data into MetPlus. And it's just, it's good to get a take on how difficult it was for you. Thanks. Sean, you have a question? Yeah, um, I was wondering, you mentioned that there's no current consistency in the data sets and they can be all over the place. Is there any efforts or rumblings of efforts to modernize that or standardize that? So I know we made rumblings um, because we we're actually coming from the weather side. We were pretty shocked and surprised at um, how inconsistent the data and data sources were. I know Amy DeCastro has been, in RAL has been doing some work to, uh, I guess, for lack of a better term, make rumblings about what, how difficult that is and try to uh, get information out about the benefits of being, having some consistent databases available. I'm not aware of what is happening on the fire side. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not as plugged in to that community. But I will say one of the major obstacles to doing any work in that area is definitely the response. So when you're out on the fire, 
responding to it, making quick decisions. Not only are they not really in the mind frame of thinking about saving data down the road, that's just another extra step of work they have to do. And you know, they've been out there for weeks, they're tired, uh, they're sleeping in tents. Um, it's, it's a really difficult environment for them to be in. So as we kind of work towards maybe having more consistent availability of the data and archiving of the data, we need to keep in mind who we're putting the burden on um, when, when we're trying to accomplish that. I don't think that really answered your question, but that's all the more information I have. No, it, it helps a lot. Thank you. Do we have any questions from others that are not on the Met Plus team? Although I'm I'm glad to see that the Met Plus team is is asking questions. Okay. Um, if not, then uh, why don't we go ahead and say thank you to Amanda. Um, I, I thought it was a very enlightening presentation. Um, you know, I, I know that we've had these conversations before, um, Amanda, but to just kind of see you lay out, especially the challenges that, um, that you're, we're facing um, with observation data sets and, and so forth is, you know, something to, to definitely keep in mind. So I um, greatly appreciate that. Um, and so if there's no more questions for that, um, John, oh, are you still raising your hand with another question or did you, did you want to move on? Uh, nope. I think I just emoted. That was it. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, um, so then we're going to take the last few minutes here. Um, John has been, um, uh, doing a lot of work to try and, and, uh, make it easier for people to get started with MET Plus. And so he wanted to take some time to update folks on that. So uh, I'll hand it over to you, John. Take it away. All right. Sounds good. Um, can everybody see the slide deck starting? Hopefully. Yes. Excellent. OK. Let me throw that into present mode. All right. So um, as uh, Tara mentioned, I'm John. I'm on the Met Plus team. And I'm going to inform everybody about a little action that went down about four or five months ago now starting. Um, and actually, I saw at least Colin is in the, the call. And he was one of the people who helped uh, make the focus group a uh, successful um, opportunity for improvement on Met Plus. So we'll cover kind of what we did, um, what we found, um, what's going to happen as a result of the focus group, and then additionally cover um, what might happen in the future um, concerning more focus group activities. Um, so first, let's get into what exactly was it? What was it? Um, the overall goal going into this was to increase the accessibility of Met Plus across its user base, especially for those attempting to use the system for the first time. And that caveat at the last sentence, the last part of that sentence, was the most important. Um, we got a lot of requests from new users to make it more streamlined to get from zero to 60. Um, Met Plus isn't too tough once you understand what you're doing and once you really get a hold of what wrappers you need and what tools you need for your specific analysis. It's actually pretty streamlined, especially now. But when you first start out, it can seem very daunting because the documentation was very um, partitioned out into different areas. And part of that was because it spans decades of growth. Um, that's that's not a weakness, that's a strength. We've learned as we've gone, we've learned what has worked for us and for users, but that means that we have disparate sources across many things. So you'll find some stuff on the website, you'll find some things on Read the Docs, you'll find some things in videos. Um, and it was us just trying things out or using the best system that we had access to at the time. Um, but with this focus group, we really wanted to make all of those things kind of come back together bring it up with a new kind of ease of use and interchangeability between all those sources, eliminating any redundancies, and just making it easier for those first time users to get in and start using Met Plus faster. Um, to do that, we were going to create focus teams or focus group 
that was from a diverse experience group of Met Plus users. So not just power users who have used this for as long as Met and Met Plus have been around, um, but those who are just jumping in for the first time as well. Um, because in this case, everybody's uh, reactions, both their initial and seasoned reactions are very important to understand and to grab. And then we turn that feedback into action items. Um, so we have things on our side that we are now responsible for. Um, and then lastly, this was all going to be done with the cooperation of the Met Plus repository leaders um, so that we can receive targeted feedback. So instead of just saying, what did you not like about um, the Met repository? What did you not like about the Met Plus wrappers user's guide? Um, instead, the repository managers were able to step up and say, I have questions about this. I want to see if users would like this or want changes to this. And then we put those to the focus group members so that they can respond very specifically on what's going to improve across Met Plus. Um, so this was this whole focus group was divided into two phases. Phase one started in April um, for six weeks. We had 16 participants and all of the activities were completed through Google Forms, group meetings, and submitted slides. And the submitted slides was just activities that they would do for organizational purposes, like uh, for the user's guide, I would give them all the top level chapters and ask them which ones they'd like to see um, in a newly revised um, user's guide, top level chapters. Um, so that, that slide would help us kind of quickly ascertain what they wanted in um, a situation like that. And the group meetings were everybody could drop in, um, provide what they thought of the different prompts that we had and provide real time feedback instead of through a kind of passive questionnaire where some of the nuances or some of the um, more complex thoughts couldn't be communicate, communicated as well um, as a face-to-face -face or a virtual to virtual um, opportunity. These spanned all the Met Plus repositor repositories, as I mentioned, um, and it was a mix of question styles. So some were multiple choice, some were ranking, some were a long paragraph or short paragraph, some were timed exercises, all in the effort to kind of redo those first experiences of trying to jump into Met Plus for the first time and saying, okay, I've I got to figure this out as fast as I can, or you know, as quickly as I can. It gives that pressure in the back of your mind, even if you're seasoned. Um, now you're trying to do it quickly and watch your time. So then you get more annoyed at things that probably users who are starting out for the first time would be very annoyed at because they don't have time. They just want it to work. Um, so again, using seasoned and new users in these kind of mixed question styles brought out a lot of good interaction and participation. Phase two was a shorter period. This was going for four weeks starting in September. It actually concluded at the end of September. Um, and that was only with 10 participants. But part of that was because we now had um, smaller results. We knew kind of from phase one what was going on. Um, and phase two was now going to be focused in on those selected action items that we've turned into draft form. So we used some of the suggestions, for all the suggestions really, from phase one to create those action items and then chose a few of the action items to change into basically a draft form that then the focus group members of phase two would review and provide feedback on. It's hard to know exactly what you want until it's in front of you. Um, so it was understood even on our side that going into phase two, not everything was going to be a home run. Um, some things were going to need to be revised and some things were going to be completely tossed out. Again, this was completed through Google Forms. Um, this time there weren't any group meetings or submitted slides um, because it was, again, more targeted um, and a little bit easier to get through things that way. And then from this phase, we synthesized the results, determined the priority level for the action items that were used in draft form and then to ultimately cancel any unnecessary action items that might have been formulated from phase one, but not liked so much in phase two. Um, so the results, the specific results from phase one uh, resulted in about 18 plus pages of synthesized results. Uh, so it's about three pages per week. Um, it was a lot of material, but it ultimately it's just data. It's good data. Um, a lot is better than none. Um, especially in this case. Out of that, out of those 18 pages, um, 20 action items were filtered out to the results. And those were divided amongst four categories. There was a user's guide enhancements, which had 10 action items plus two optional. Uh, tutorial updates, which was seven action items. Website improvements, which had only one action item. And then a coding miscellaneous suggestions uh, group, 
or category, which had two action items plus two optional. And the optionals were really the understanding that it was something either very radical, um, that would be a huge overhaul of work, or it was such a shift from the current paradigm that it would require us maybe not a lot of work, but it would make us change quite a bit of things in the background system or just in the upfront system. And it, it, it didn't contribute, it didn't slightly alter what we had, it would completely change things. So that's why they were optional. Um, it would take a lot more either effort or a lot of like um, completely shifting your brain thought um, to make those work. Uh, these were taken directly from the focus group feedback and it was discussed with the Met Plus team for feasibility and consensus. And again, um, out of those, we chose, I think it was nine to operate on nine or eight. Um, and these are the action items that were drafted for phase two. So out of those 20 that we had, um, plus the four optional, these ones were the ones that were identified to be put into draft form and put back in front of phase two um, for feedback. So from the user's guides uh, category, we had to include a singularity installation guide and update the Docker installation guide. Um, additionally, restructure the installation guide for Met after the following the guidance of the Wharf installation guide, specifically the Wharf installation guide, because it was mentioned by name by several of the phase one focus group participants as being something that was very easy, streamlined, and very well documented. So using that as a model rather than reinventing the wheel and trying to do something special. And then reorganizing the Met user's guide top level directory for more concise searching options. So instead of having every tool listed, um, it, they could be grouped by categories, which will allow users to very quickly zero in on what they wanted to, instead of reading a tool and trying to have a guess what that tool did or what it was related to. Um, and then also kind of cluttering up that top level and instead trying to smooth it out and make it very streamlined. Um, for the tutorial updates category, there would need to be a separation of the introduction from the grid to grid in the online tutorial. Um, some users suggested that um, by separating those out, users aren't going to be confused about how to set things up before they start the tutorial. Um, simplify, streamline, standardize the icon text changes of the online tutorial be consistent and non-distracting. Uh, before this, we had no kind of icons um, beyond just differences of font and color backgrounds, which can be kind of difficult for individuals who have um, visual impairments. Um, so that was kept in mind for color choices. And then ultimately to update the online tutorial to include more links to the user's guide. Um, additionally, um, for more action items that were drafted, these are also in the tutorial updates group or category. Um, refactor the online tutorial from top to bottom. This was one of the biggest ones and is still very much ongoing um, because it is a very large one. But the examples need to progress in difficulty following the teach me, show me, let me try approach. Um, this is something that somebody mentioned in the focus group and I kind of researched it and it's a, very, it's a very good suggestion. The idea being that the first example you want people to see, like basically sit in the bleachers um, where you're just kind of talking to them, walking them through something and showing out how they do with very minimal interaction expected. For the next example, you want the users to start getting their hands dirty. You want them to start coding a little bit. I'm very much still training wheels on. Um, there's, there's no, uh, jumping off the diving board or, um, you're left for your to fend for yourself and told i get this output here's all the tools you need that's it hands off um but this is much more like here's the tools you'll need here's the commands you're going to try here's some copy and paste commands put in now go ahead and run it um so very much that training wheels taken care of and then the let me try is the here's the tools here's the output you need to get from it go ahead and try it and if you've been following the teach me and show me phases the let me try is just a natural progression of that um, and by doing that, it hard codes your brain um, to be able to do that naturally on your own when you're like, okay, now that I have my data, I know how to do this myself. Or I know kind of the beginning steps. You might run into things that you didn't expect, like um, compiler issues or missing packages. That's just part of life, um, at least when you're using MetPlus. And, but once you get past those initial hurdles of things that might be conflicting issues, Having that teach me, show me, let me try background will help you get through most of these issues. So it is very important that we get this tutorial update done. 
Um, finally, in this group, we have the Remake the Wire diagram, which is a very effective way to see all the tools, but again, trying to make it more visually friendly for beginners in the tutorial. And then creating an introduction, introduction to statistics section so that people can have the basics of what the statistics line types are and kind of how statistics works in general. What is categorical? What is continuous? Um, how, do, how do probabilistic statistics work in MetPlus? Maybe you know a little bit about them, but you don't know how they are applied in the MetPlus system. So um, that kind of tutorial would help quite a bit. Phase two results, um, this was a lot less results because like I said, we had targeted questions. There was only five pages of synthesized results. Um, very positive feedback on a few items, including the stats one-on-one -on -one section for the tutorial, the introduction to se section for the tutorial where we separated it out. Uh, the wire diagram redo, which you can see on the right side of the screen, is where we grayed out before all the colors were here. And now you have an immediate focus on the tools that are going to be used um, and nothing more, which helps. I think uh, especially new users understand just exactly what you're doing instead of being overwhelmed by this very large wire diagram which every year or every version seems to just increase in complexity um and then the tutorial icons again you can see those on the right image in the lower right corner with the stop sign and the light bulb combining both colors and symbols that we basically universally rec recognize um, so that people kind of start um, naturally understanding what to do when they see these icons instead of having to say, what did the yellow background mean? What did the italics mean? Um, that kind of stuff. And then um, the positive feedback for the focus group itself was very strong. People really enjoyed the idea of giving their responses to issues with um, MetPlus or ways that they saw that the system can improve or streamline its documentation structure. Um, so the constructive feedback we got, again, the tutorial icons. Um, there were other icons besides these ones that we used. The users weren't quite sure what they were. Um, and that just means for us, we need to go back and think about what provides a more natural symbol and color combination that lets people know exactly what we're trying to do while also kind of simplifying um, what kind of uh, commands are going with those icons. Um, the tutorial structure, um, again, we need to follow the, the basics of that one and just do the three-step approach. Um, it's gonna require a large overhaul, but most of the users, actually almost all the users, um, indicated that it was uh, very much necessary and it's going to allow them to get into the tutorial versus just trying to go straight into the user's guides, which a lot of um, individuals indicated that's how they try to learn MET or MET Plus originally. And then finally, um, the MET user's guide reorganization. Um, it's going to take a little bit of effort um, just to get some of those tools into groups that make sense. Um, or to organize the groups in a way that it makes sense that, you know, someone who wants to see it specifically for tropical cyclones can look at it and get the same appreciation out of, out of the structure or the reorganization as someone who's just going in to do a little um, uh, buoy observation um, verification. Uh, everybody has their own preference, but trying to meet all of them at least midway um, is really going to take a little bit of effort. And luckily, some of the results and feedback from phase two will help do that. Ultimately, what's next? Um, so we're going to eliminate some of the unnecessary action items. Uh, one of the things uh, that I'll show as an example is that um, the videos that I suggested from phase one as an action item um, at the beginning of each tutorial session, there was going to be like a three to four minute video. Most folks group members said that's not necessary, especially if we make a splash page with that wire diagram, which has been updated, um, make it nice and clean and use plain language, it'll be fine. We don't need videos. Um, so that, that allowed us to get rid of an action item, which lets us focus more on the ones that currently do exist. Um, review the suggestions, feedbacks with the repository leads. Now that we know kind of what the focus group wants, more targeted from those draft items, um, we can now go back to the MetPlus repository leads and let them know kind of what focus group members want and then see what the leads want done or um, want streamlined or what priorities they have and try to blend the two. Uh, we can finish work on the priority action items as they sifted out from the focus group. In that case, it's the download instructions, the stats 101 tutorial, and the tutorial redesign or overhaul following the, uh, the three-step process. 
Um, we're going to shift to development on the remaining action items after those priority action items are complete. And then ultimately keep an eyes open for new focus group topics and opportunities. Because again, as I mentioned, all the focus group members really express strong um, approval of doing focus groups at regular intervals in very small focused um, areas instead of trying to do a scatter shot like we did this first um, opportunity trying to cover everything of met plus they'd like to see more frequent with more specific um development areas and it's it's a great way of getting feedback from the user group um, especially those who are just starting out or even those who remember how it was starting out um and now getting back in getting their voice heard and getting documentation that does exist um, across all these places into a way that is usable. Because again, as many people have said over the years, you can design the best system in the world, but if people can't use it, it's useless. So um, that's what we're doing here, is that we are designing a great system and now we're trying to bring our documentation up to that same level. Uh, that is all I had uh, for this. Um, are there any questions? So John, did you say when um, all of uh, much of this work is going to be uh, available? No. Uh, so right now, the Stats 101 um, tutorial is partially up. It's the I think the categorical section is currently in the 5.0 tutorial. Um, we are currently in development for Met Plus 6.0, so the tutorial will receive a a new. Um, a new update to a lot of the commands so that it reflects the 6.0 versus the 5.0 commands. Um, and in that time, I do expect the Stats 101 tutorial to be complete. Um, the download instructions should probably be done in the next beta, actually in beta three. Um, I'll have to work with um, the leads on that one. And then the tutorial redesign, that one may be done, I'm hoping by, again, MET Plus 6.0, because it'll naturally just flow in to the redesign. Um, and then as the other ones shake out, I'm really hopeful that we can get either in 6.0 um, or a little bit earlier, but expect most of them to fall in 6.0 because these top three uh, priority action items are going to take quite a bit of um, effort and time. All right, thanks. And for those that um, don't necessarily know all of the references that he, he made to like beta three and and um, major releases and, and so forth. Um, basically, we're looking at um, a coordinated uh, release probably in the spring, in the March, April, May timeframe, and having um, a, a, what we call beta releases prior to that um, for testing purposes. And, and so beta three right now is, is scheduled for a release in, um, in the January timeframe, so. Okay, um, we have three minutes left. Are there any last minute questions for today? All right, if not, uh, thank you everybody for joining us and uh, join us back again um, in two weeks on the 15th at the same time. Um, when we'll be uh, spending more time on Python embedding and then demonstrating using some, uh, you know, novel um, data sets uh, and how to how to do that and moving forward. So thanks everybody for your time and attention. I'm going to stop recording. Sounds good. Thanks. <laughs>